God is our refuge. Now, here, here's what happens to us when we're in the cave. When we're in the cave, we pray for a refuge. We pray for a place to go. We pray for a friend to have. We pray for a husband to love us. We pray for a father who cares. We pray for a fill in the blank. What David says is, you are my refuge. David never gave up on God. Even when he found himself in a cave, he said, you are my refuge. I love that. Because I think when we're in a cave, when we ask for that place or that person or that whatever to fill, we're settling for second place. Because God is the best. God is what you need. And God is what he, he desires to be in your life, right there by your side. But we settle for second place. I was listening to a Christian radio station, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to pick up the, the whole story. And the, the, whole, you know, the whole story, I got just at the very end. But it was, it was a story about a guy who had grown up in an orphanage. He grew up without any parents. He grew up with no family and no home. At the age, what I remember from the radio is at the age of 17, the orphanage gave him a bus ticket and said, you are now your own. You are now out of this orphanage. We can no longer take care of you. Here you go. Here's the bus ticket to wherever you want to go, to whatever city you want to be, and, and, and we're done. Now this man had come to put his faith in Jesus. And as this man was driving in this bus to some place where there was no home, he traveled through the area that he was born. And when he hit this neighborhood that he was born in, he saw these kids playing. And he saw these parents alongside these kids. And he cried out to God, Why would you do this to me? I have no home and I have no father. And in that moment, God said to him, I am your home and I am your father. That's what I'm talking about. Those are legitimate requests for a dad. It's a legitimate request to have a home. It's a legitimate request to have, you know, the things that we ask for. I'm not, I'm not to have a healing happen, to have, you know, a husband back home, to, to have a wife who, you know, those things are legitimate responses. We're in the midst of the cave. I'm not saying that we're asking for the wrong things. But what, what I'm saying, though, is that we settle for second. And rather than grasping hold and holding on to and proclaiming that God is our refuge, that God is our father, that God is our husband, that God can replace every need that we want, we're settling for second place. Because let me tell you, when we begin to grasp hold, when we begin to grasp hold of the fact that God is, you fill in the blank. You will truly have joy and it will never be able to be taken away from you. When you lose your home, you're okay. Because God is our refuge. God is your home. When no one cares and all your friends have left you, it's okay. God is your friend. And he's right there with you. That can, that can never be taken away. People, when you are in the midst of the cave, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. How do we get out? Number one, don't give up on God. And number two, do the next right thing. Do the next right thing. When we find ourselves in a cave, we want to know how are we going to get out of here and we want to know how can we get out of here the fastest way possible, right? That's what we want to do. 
But what we have to learn is we just need to do the next right thing. Look at Psalm 142, verses 5 through 7a. We, we've, just, we've just read them. What is David's next right thing? What does he do? He just cries out to God. He prays. He seeks God himself out. That's his action. That's what he does. In fact, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 22, we talked about this last week, but if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 22, you, you see kind of what happens when, when at one time David found himself in a cave. We don't know if, the, if these two stories correspond or not. But what we do know is when David found himself in a cave, when he was all alone and the enemy was pursuing him, it, it says in 1 Samuel 20, chapter 22, uh, verses 1 and 2, well, we have the, we have the uh, stuff behind us, so we can, we can read this together. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. We can, we can see it for ourselves what, what, David, what David does. David left Goth and escaped to the cave of Adullam. That's what we talked about last week. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. So that's pretty cool. Family comes. That's, that's really cool. Right? Verse, verse 2. All those who, who were in distress or in debt or discontented. Can you imagine that? Wonderful group of people. Okay? <laughs> All right. Gathered around him and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. So what should he do? Let's go kill Saul. I've got 400 men. These, I mean, these people, like, they are like, they are like the grime of the grime. Like, they're discontented. They don't like Saul. They don't like what's going on. Let's just, let's just do it, man. Let's get out of this cave, you know. Let's, 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 let's do it ourselves. But look at, look at verse 3. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? What did he do? Would, would you let my father and mother come and stay? He finds this safe place. But then he says, let my mom and dad stay so that with you, until I learn what God will do for me. He waits on God. So he left them with the king of Moab and stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. But the prophet God said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of, of Hereth. He does the next right thing. When you find yourself in a cave, do the next right thing. He, he, here's what we do. Here's what most of us do. We get in a cave and then we process. And we go... How long and how bad is this cave? How long am I going to be here? And how bad is it going to be? And based upon how long and how bad, we'll base upon what we do. If it's going to be long, if it's going to be a long road and a hard road, well, let's just, let's just get out of here. Let's do it our way. If it's short, and, you know, if we could kind of see our way out, well, let's just do what, let's do what God wants us to do. Let's do the next right thing. Because, you know, it's, oh, it's only going to be for, but if it's long and hard, let's just do what we want to do. Let's just get out of this cave. And here's what we say to ourselves. Let's just get out. And after I'm out, I'll do what God wants me to do. You with me? I mean, if I, if I can just get out. Then, I'll, you know, God, you'll forgive me. Thank, you know, wow, thanks fully Jesus came and he forgives me, so he'll forgive me, so certainly I'll be forgiven. And then I'll start doing the right things and all these kind of things. The problem is we miss out. We miss out on the greatest gift in all of life. And that is an intimate, close relationship with God. We settle for second place because we just want to get out. What's the next right thing for you? For some of you, the next right thing is to do what David did, which is simply to pray. Just physically to go find a place alone and go and pray. That may be the next right thing for you to do. The, the next right thing for you to do may be 
to forgive somebody who has hurt you. The next right thing for you to do may be to confess something that you have done or are doing. The deeper you are in the cave, the harder that next right step is going to be. But it's much more significant that you make that step. Go to the doctor and find out what's wrong. Go talk to your son who's in rebellion. Do the next right thing. Whatever it is. I know that you want to know the way out. I know that you want to know every step along the way. I know 